What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Martian MMA podcast. I am your host, and my name is John. And this week, we are back with episode 110, where we will be analyzing and predicting the UFC 252 pay per view going down this Saturday, August 15th, 2020. This 11 fight car will take place from Las Vegas at the UFC Apex in the small cage, and the first fight will start at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Unfortunately, last week was a rough week in terms of betting for me and track picks. I lost 9.3 units, and it was my first losing event of the past 8 UFC events, but I am still up over 40 units for the year 2020, and I've still won in 13 of the past 15 UFC events, so I'm not going to get discouraged from one losing week, and I'm going to get right back to the bets this week. There's a lot of value on this card. I like some bets already, and we'll be breaking down all 11 fights here shortly. So we're going to start things off in the featherweight division. We have Kai Kamaka taking on Tony Kelly. The opening betting line for this one was Kamaka the favorite at Minus 185 to Kelly coming back at plus 160. Right now we are looking at Kamaka minus 170 to Kelly plus 150. The early action here came in on Kamaka and he was actually a minus 250 favorite for a short period of time. But it seems like the action is coming back in on Tony Kelly. And I got to disagree with the late action. I think that there's a lot of value on Kai Kamaka at this current line. Tony Kelly is kind of a weird fighter. He only has two fights in the past four years, and one fight was a five-round fight against Kevin Aguilar. It was a fun, competitive fight, a lot of back-and-forth grappling and striking. He looked pretty good in that fight. And then his most recent fight in 2019 versus Brosette, he was taken down easily very early in that fight. He was using his full guard. He wasn't looking to stand back up to his feet. But luckily for him, he was fighting a really low-level opponent and managed to get a guillotine off of his back in some really weird grappling exchange so in the past four years we haven't really seen kelly look good in a fight meanwhile kai kamaka is coming off of a win in lfa just two weeks ago it was a decision win over stack really fun competitive fight he won round one uh, lost round two in some competitive striking exchanges and then came back and hit a takedown in round three to win that third round and win a decision but i was really impressed with what i saw from kamaka he has good uh, combination striking he mixes it up to the body he throws kicks with his punches a lot so he's a really good striker in my opinion i'm really excited to see how he looks here I think he can outstrike Kelly on the feet, possibly even knock him out, and I think he also can hit takedowns and keep top position. If you watch some of Kamaka's Bellator fights, he really likes shooting uh, offensive takedowns and keeping top position there. So I think Kamaka should win this fight comfortably wherever it goes. I actually think that Kamaka's chances here are more like 75 to 80 percent. So I could see him winning this fight by knockout submission or decision, and I think that at minus 170, he is a great bet. So the pick for me is going to be Kamaka by decision, and I will be betting him at this minus 170 price. The next fight is in the heavyweight division. We have Parker Porter taking on Chris Dockhaus. The opening betting line for this one was Porter, the minus 165 favorite to Dockhaus plus 125. Right now we are seeing Porter minus 122, Dockhaus plus 100. So more action coming in on the underdog Dockhaus here, and I agree with that action. This is a really low level heavyweight fight. I don't think either are UFC level to be honest, but Dockhouse looks like the much quicker and more athletic fighter. Porker looks pretty fat and jiggly, to be honest, and that's a concern here. Dockhouse has also been more active lately. I think he's fought and beaten the better competition. But I will say that uh, Porter has an advantage because he has gone into the later rounds more recently. We really haven't seen Dockhouse out of round one much. And we've seen Parker Porter outside of round one in his most recent fights. And he did good in those fights. He had some decent cardio. He was able to get top position and win both of those fights via finish so I think Porter has some upside here it's not a really confident pick on either side but I think that Doc House should outstrike Porter here avoid getting taken down on stuck on his back and possibly even knock out Porter on the feet so I'm going to go with Doc House by decision as my official prediction but it's a really low level fight I really wouldn't recommend betting either side the people who got in on Doc House at that plus 125 price there was some value there but where it's at now, I think the price is pretty much accurate, and I'm going to side with Doc House to win a decision. But no strong leans here, and it's not a fight I would bet much on. The next fight takes place in the featherweight division. We have TJ Brown taking on Danny Chavez. The opening betting line for this one was 
Brown, the favorite at minus 195 to Chavez plus 155. Right now we are seeing Brown minus 150 to Chavez plus 130. So more action coming in on the underdog Chavez in this one. And I disagree with the action here. And it's a hard fight to predict because there's not much footage of Chavez out there. I had to dig pretty deep on Instagram and Facebook to find some of his most recent fights. And he looks like a solid striker. He has some fast kicks, some decent punches. The biggest concern about Chavez is we really haven't seen his defensive grappling tested much and that's what you really want to see when he's fighting TJ Brown because TJ Brown shoots a lot of offensive takedowns and definitely prefers to grapple throughout most of his fights. The only fight that we've seen Chavez defend takedowns in was the Henderson fight and he did okay defending some early shots but eventually did get taken down a few times in round two of that fight. He was able to stuff some takedowns and win the striking in round three and win that fight via decision but I don't think that that was a good sign from Chavez that he got taken down by Henderson there and Brown is a really athletic aggressive guy and I just think that Chavez is really going to struggle defending the takedowns and not getting stuck on his back here so on the feet I think it's a very competitive fight I would give it a slight advantage to Chavez here I think he's just the more technical clean striker and TJ fights pretty reckless in the feet. He doesn't have the best defense at times and he could be even a little chinny. He's definitely got dropped in a few of his fights throughout his career. But I do not think this fight will stay on the feet for long. I'm relying on Brown to shoot a high amount of takedowns like he always does. And I think he gets Chavez down. I think he likely keeps Chavez down. He doesn't have the greatest top position or top control as evident in the Jordan Griffin fight where he was winning that fight from top position but somehow managed to get choked out from that crazy guillotine from bottom half guard. Uh, that definitely wasn't a great sign from Brown and losing his debut, but he was in control of that fight, winning it very dominantly before getting caught in that weird choke. So I don't think that happens here. I think that if Brown loses, it will likely be a striking knockout. And I think that Brown hits takedowns, keeps top position, and likely gets a submission somewhere along the line. So the pick for me is going to be TJ Brown by submission. And at this minus 150 price, there is a lot of value left on that. I would cap him closer to 65, 70% here. So there is a lot of value on that minus 150 price tag. The next fight takes place in the women's strawweight division. We have Felice Herrig taking on Verna Jane Trudoba. The opening betting line for this one was Jane Trudoba, the minus 155 favorite to Herrig plus 125. Right now we are seeing Jane Trudoba minus 320 to Herrig plus 260. A ton of action coming in on the favorite, Verna Jane Jordoba, and I agree with that action. I think that where it sits at now is maybe a bit wide with Herrig sitting at plus 260, but there's a lot of reasons to like Jane Jordoba in this fight. Felice Herrig is coming off of a two-year layoff, and she's coming off knee surgery. She tore her ACL and has been rehabbing that for a few months now and is finally ready to get back in the cage, but I just don't like this matchup for her because Jane Jordoba is a great grappler, and Felice tends to struggle with getting taken down and stuck on her back that's how Paige Van Zandt beat her back in the day and we even saw some of that in her most recent fight against Michelle Watterson she ended up on bottom in some sloppy grappling exchanges and basically just held full guard and did nothing off of her back for two or three minutes so I think that Jane Doba likely hits takedowns here and dominates Herrick from top position I mean, Jane Doba is a much better top position grappler than Michelle Watterson was, and Michelle Watterson kept her down for three minutes, so I think that Jane Doba easily keeps top position here and likely submits Herrig somewhere along the lines. On the feet, I do expect Herrig to be edging these striking exchanges and even the clinch. Uh, Herrig is very strong in the clinch and will likely be hard to take down, but I think that once she gets on her back, I think that the fight is pretty much over. Jane Jordoba is just going to dominate from top position, and it'll be a very clear path to victory that uh, Jane Jordoba realizes once she gets Herrig on her back. So if it stays in the feet and in the clinch, I do favor Herrig, but I just don't think the fight will stay there. But where the money line is at, I do think it is dog or pass. I wouldn't be laying that 3-1 to one on Jane Jordoba here just because I think that if she doesn't get takedowns, she likely struggles and possibly even loses here. And I do think she got, gets the takedowns, gets the submission, but even at minus 320, I don't th think there's any value in it. It's dog or pass at this money line. The next fight takes place in the women's strawweight division. We have Lavina Souza taking on Ashley Yoder. The opening betting line for this one was Souza, the favorite, at minus 250 to Yoder plus 195. Right now we are seeing Souza minus 160 to Yoder plus 140. More action coming in on the dog, Ashley Yoder, here, and rightfully so. I think that 
Even at the current price, I think there's still some value left on Ashley Yoder. I think this is more of a 50-50 type of fight. It likely goes to the scorecards, and it could even be a split decision type of fight. So I wouldn't go crazy betting either side here, but I do think there is a considerable amount of value on Ashley Yoder here. I watched a lot of Sosa's fights, and I just really haven't liked what I've seen from her. The Frota fight, she was getting outstruck on the feet for periods of time, and Frota is really low level. She was flopping to her back and pulling guard at certain times. She hit some takedowns in top position, but she just wasn't doing much with them. So I think that I struggle to see where Sosa has advantages over Yoder here because I give Yoder a striking advantage. I think she has the cleaner technique, and she has the more effective strikes of the two. Both of their defenses are pretty bad, though, so I think that when the fight is in striking distance, it's going to be a lot of sloppy, even exchanges, but I'm going to give a slight advantage to Yoder. And I think that Yoder is a little better of a grappler too. I think she's more effective when she has top position. She likes getting back takes and she has some pretty good top control. And even from bottom position, I think Yoder is better too because she actually works for submissions and sweeps and tries to get off of her back while Souza can just be content to play guard and to take some breathers when she's on her back. And I just really didn't like what I saw from Souza when she was on her back versus Van Buren and versus Frota. So I think that Yoder could hit offensive takedowns here and and look to keep top position versus Souza. I think that Yoder could outstrike Souza on the feet. And I just give slight advantages to Ashley Yoder everywhere here. It's not the most confident pick because it is a pretty low level sloppy fight. But I'm going to side with Ashley Yoder here. I will be betting her at this plus 140 price for maximum one, one and a half units. I won't go more than that because it's just too sloppy to be confident in. But I do think this line is considerably off. It's more of a 50-50 type of fight. And I'm going to side with Ashley Yoder to edge a decision here. And she's going to be my pick. The next fight takes place in the lightweight division. We have Jim Miller taking on Vince Peichel. The opening betting line for this one was Miller minus 180 to Peichel plus 140. Right now we are seeing Peichel minus 135 to Miller plus 115. So the line has flipped. The early action came in on Peichel and people are still betting Peichel as a favorite. I think that where the opening line was at was a bit wide but where it's at now i think that it is wrong honestly and i think that miller should be the favorite here i think that i like the value on miller plus 115 both guys are coming off of victories over roosevelt roberts Peichel struggled early in that fight, was getting outstruck for the first six or seven minutes before he started hitting takedowns and out grappling roosevelt roberts from top position but even in that round two, it was a close round, and I think that Peichel stole the round in the last 30 seconds by getting a takedown and some top position at the end of the round. And then he was able to win round three clearly, took him down, grinded him out from top position, even got a back take at the end of the fight. So Peichel dug deep and had some good cardio in that fight, made the right adjustments, but it was still a very close fight versus Roosevelt Roberts. He got outstruck a distance versus Roberts. So I think I'm going to favor Jim Miller as the better distance striker here. He's had the much more effective striking lately. He's actually rocked a lot of his opponents. He's still got some pop in his left hand. And he's been coming out of the gate fast in his past few fights. I think like five out of six of his past fights have ended in the first round. So Miller's cardio has been pretty untested lately. The only time we've seen him go out of round one in his past six fights was versus Holtzman. And he did lose that fight. So if this fight goes into the second half of the fight, it goes past the 7-8 minute mark, I will start to favor Peichel then, but for the first 7 minutes, I think I'm favoring Jim Miller here. I think he's the more dangerous and effective striker. I think he's got the better submissions of the two. And if you look at Peichel's most recent fight, he was only able to win that fight because he hit takedowns and was able to exploit the bad defensive grappling of Roosevelt Roberts. Well, he's not going to be able to do that here because Jim Miller is much harder to take down, much harder to keep on his back. And I think that Peichel will be in danger if he goes to the ground with Miller because I do think that Miller is the slightly better grappler. So in the first half of the fight, I favor Jim Miller pretty heavily here. I think he's going to win the first half of the fight. I think he could even finish Vince Peichel in the first round here. But if it does go past that 7-8 minute mark, I will start to favor the cardio advantage of Peichel. And I think that Miller tends to slow down and probably starts to lose the fight in the later half. But I think I'm going to side with Jim Miller to either get out to an early lead and win rounds 1 and 2 
to win a decision or get a finish in the first half of the fight. So the pick for me is going to be Jim Miller. I think the most likely way he gets it done is by decision, but I could see a finish too because he's been finishing a lot of guys lately. He's been hurting people with his punches and then finish them off with his chokes. So I like Jim Miller in this fight. I think at plus money, he is the value side. And I think that you will get a chance to live bet Paicho at plus money sometime throughout this fight too. So I will be pre-fight betting Miller here pretty small because it's not the most confident pick. Miller is getting a little less durable and less reliable throughout his uh, later career. So I won't be going too heavy on this fight, but I will be betting Miller pre-fight and looking to bet Peichel if he survives that early onslaught from Miller. The next fight is the first fight on the main card in the featherweight division. We have Herbert Burns taking on Daniel Pineda. The opening betting line for this one was Burns the favorite at minus 200 to Pineda plus 160. Right now we are seeing Burns minus 280 to Pineda plus 240. Much more action coming in on the favorite, Herbert Burns here. And I disagree with the action. I think that where the opening line was set was accurate. But where it's at now, there is value on Pineda, and it is dog or pass. This is a pretty high variance fight. I think it could have a lot of different outcomes. And I think if they fought 10 times, we could see 10 different outcomes. So I'm not really confident in either side here, but I do like the value on Pineda as a dog. Burns is just very untested and hasn't really fought too many good fighters throughout his career. I was pretty impressed with the way he dealt with Evan Dunham. Definitely the toughest test of his career. He was able to get a quick takedown, get the back of Dunham, and get a rear naked choke. And Dunham is no joke. He's a solid defensive grappler. He's definitely past his prime, but the way that Burns dealt with him and got the quick finish was impressive. But he just tends to fight really recklessly, doesn't really have good striking defense, and isn't really that much of a dominant grappler to where I think he's going to take down and easily submit Pineda here. I was a little concerned from the grappling that I saw from Pineda in the Jeremy Kennedy fight. He made some bad grappling IQ moves in that fight. He was stuck on bottom for periods of time, but got a lucky guillotine off of his back and was kind of bailed out by that submission there. But he was able to take down uh, Georgie Karakian and keep top position from several minutes. And he's actually effective as a wrestler and as a top position grappler. So that could be a path to victory here. Burns definitely isn't good off of his back. We saw him struggle with Derek Minner's top pressure for a little bit. And I think that Pineda could look to hit offensive takedowns to kind of slow Burns down in the early rounds of this fight. And on the feet... Burns is going to be coming forward, throwing a lot of volume, being really aggressive, but he's going to be open for counter punches. As I mentioned, his defense is pretty bad, and I think that we could see Pineda outstrike him and possibly even knock Burns out here. There are a lot of different ways this fight could play out. I could see Pineda getting an early finish. I could see Pineda winning by decision. I could see Burns winning by early finish as well. So a lot of different ways it could play out. I think that Pineda is the value side. I think Pineda by knockout in round one is a decent prop bet. If I had to think of the most common way the fight ends, I do think it is Burns by submission in round one. I just think that they get into some crazy type of brawl in round one. It's going to be back and forth. I think the Pineda probably looks live at that two to one price, but eventually gets in a bad spot on the ground. Uh, I think Burns probably takes his back at some point, maybe gets a choke in of some sort. So not a confident pick because I, as I mentioned, the fight could play out in a lot of different ways. I like the value on Pineda. And I think that if Pineda gets out of round one, the, fi the fight should start to favor him. But Burns is dangerous in round one. He can't be taken lightly, although he is a a bit unproven, untested. I still think he's dangerous in round one, and I think he probably gets a submission here uh, versus Pineda in that round one, but it'll be a good live betting spot on Pineda. I will be betting Pineda here despite picking Burns round one finish. Uh, so it's a very tough fight to predict and bet, but I will be betting Pineda here, but picking Burns round one submission. The next fight takes place in the Bantamweight division. We have John Dodson taking on Mirab Davalashvili. The opening betting line for this one was Mirab minus 170 to Dodson plus 145. Right now, we are seeing Dvalashvili minus 245 to Dodson plus 205. More action coming in on the favorite Mirab Dvalashvili here. I'm actually going to disagree with that action. I think that Mirab deserves to be a small favorite here. And I understand why he's getting bet. I mean, he's a tank of a fighter. He has incredible numbers, hits a high amount of takedowns, great cardio, relentless pressure. But I think that John Dodson is 
probably one of the worst matchups in the entire division here for him. John Dodson has great takedown defense. He's got good get up. So Mirab's going to be shooting takedowns here, but I don't think he's going to get much with that takedown. I think that he likely gets Dodson to the floor, but Dodson's going to pop right back up to his feet. And that's kind of a fatal flaw of Mirab Devalashvili is he doesn't really have a top control game to go along with this takedown. So he hits a high amount of takedowns, but he doesn't really keep that top position and he tends to kind of waste energy going for these takedowns. If you watch the Frankie Signs fight, he took Signs down 11 times in that fight, but he was outstruck at distance, he was outstruck in the clinch, and Signs just stood up from all of his takedowns and just continued to outstrike Mirab Devalashvili. And I think that that's what happens versus Dodson here is Mirab's going to take Dodson down, Dodson's going to get back up to his feet, and he's going to get right back to outstriking Mirab because at distance, I think that Dodson is the better striker, no question. He's the more effective and harder puncher, and he has the much better defense. Mirab kind of just marches forward with bad defense at times and is way too uh, reliant on his chin and his toughness. And I think that Dodson is going to be countering him here. He's going to be using his great footwork to stay off the cage to avoid getting taken down. And I think that Dodson is going to be winning these striking exchanges, avoid getting stuck on his back. And I think I'm actually going to pick John Dodson to win this fight here. Even though he is the plus 205 underdog right now, there is some huge value on Dodson because I think this fight is closer to 60-40 in terms of Mirab. So where the line is at now with Dodson, his chances being around 33%, I think there's a lot of value on that. And I'm actually going to pick John Dodson to win this fight outright. I think he wins it by decision. He could get a knockout here, but I just think that Mirab is just so tough and so durable that he's going to somehow see a decision here. But I will also be betting Dodson no scorecards at minus 160. I loaded up on that because Dodson has never been finished in my opinion. I think, I don't know, it's just an off the top of my head uh, assumption. And Mirab has also never really finished anybody in the UFC. He fought a really low-level opponent in his last fight and still went to the decision versus him. So I highly doubt that Dodson gets finished here. So that no scorecards has a ton of value on it. I'm going to pick John Dodson to avoid getting stuck on his back, avoid getting taken down too much, outstrike Mirab on the feet, and to win this fight via decision. So the pick is going to be John Dodson by decision. The next fight takes place in the heavyweight division. We have Jarzino Rosenstrike taking on Junior Dos Santos. The opening betting line for this one was Rosenstrike minus 140 to Dos Santos plus 110. Right now we are seeing Rosenstrike minus 130 to Dos Santos plus 110. So the line is staying about the same, but that early action did come in on Jarzino Rosenstrike, he was around minus 150 for a few weeks, but seems like that action is coming back in on Junior Dos Santos during fight week. And I agree with the action on Dos Santos. I understand why it's coming in too. He's the much more well known fighter, former champion. And Rosenstrike is just a weird fighter, man. It's really hard to get a feel on how good he is. He tends to be low output on the feet, but he has extreme power in his hands. He's knocked out a lot of opponents in the UFC already. But he has a glaring weakness in in his takedown defense. He's a very weak grappler. He got taken down versus Junior Albini and stuck on his back in a lot in that fight. And he also got taken down by Alistair Overeem and stuck on his back. So if Junior Dos Santos approaches this fight with a smart game plan to clinch up Rosen Strike, to avoid distance striking, and to possibly hit takedowns, Junior Dos Santos could look like a massive favorite out there. But if he keeps the fight at distance striking and tries to kickbox with Rosen Strike, I do think he loses and possibly even gets knocked out because Junior Dos Santos has just been looking slower and slower on the feet. His striking is not the same as it once was. His reaction speed, his chin is not the same. He actually got rocked and finished on the feet by Curtis Blades last fight. So I definitely think that Junior Dos Santos loses the striking exchanges in this fight. Although he is possible for just a knockout and a swing fest on the feet too. That's a very real possibility. So I just think that Junior Dos Santos has so many more ways to win this fight. He could get a random knockout. It is heavyweight after all. He could maybe surprise me and outstrike Rosenstrike on the feet to a decision, similar like to he did versus Blagoy Ivanov not that long ago. Or he could look to exploit that bad takedown defense of Rosenstrike, get top positions, win rounds on top, or even get a submission. So I just like Junior Dos Santos in this fight. I think he has more ways to win. It's not a confident pick because Junior Dos Santos is way past his prime. He's been looking a lot less durable in his fights lately. And his cardio has been a bit of a concern as well. A lot of his fights have been ended in the first two rounds. While Rosenstrike's cardio, I think, is pretty solid. He lost the first three rounds versus 
over Reem and was able to come back with high output in rounds four and five of that fight and win by knockout in round five. So I do give Rosenstrike a cardio advantage here. I give him a slight striking advantage, but if do Dos Santos approaches this fight with a the right game plan, he could win this fight easily, hit takedowns, out grapple Rosenstrike, and I like Junior, Junior Dos Santos at the plus money here, and I'm going to pick him to win by decision. I could even see a submission or knockout along the way, but I think decision is the most likely. He probably wins around rounds one and two with top position and survives till round three to make it to the scorecard. So the pick is going to be Junior Dos Santos by decision. The next fight takes place in the bantamweight division. We have Sean O'Malley taking on Marlon Vera. The opening betting line for this one was O'Malley the favorite at minus 230 to Vera plus 180. Right now we are seeing O'Malley minus 265 to Vera plus 225. More action coming in on the favorite Sean O'Malley in this one. He is the fan favorite fighter, but I disagree with the action here. I think this fight is much closer than the odds indicate. And I think that Marlon Vera is the toughest opponent Sean O'Malley has fought, but by a good margin. And you cannot say the same about Marlon Vera. Marlon Vera has fought and beaten the much better competition than Sean O'Malley. He's been in the UFC for twice, three times as long, has way more experience. And I think that there's a lot of advantages in this fight for Marlon Vera. I do give Sean O'Malley a slight distance striking advantage. I think he is the faster and more powerful striker of the two. And Vera just tends to not have the best defense when he is striking. But I don't think that O'Malley is some incredible knockout artist like his last two fights have made him out to be. He was fighting some pretty lower level guys like Wineland and Quinones and was able to get some nice knockouts over them. But if you watch his fights against Tarion Ware or Sukumtot, you realize that O'Malley is not some knockout artist. He doesn't just drop people dead with his power. And if he doesn't knock you out, he tends to struggle on the feet. When he's moving backwards, he's not very effective. He actually got outvolumed versus Tarion Ware in round two of their fight. We saw Sean O'Malley struggle a little bit in round three versus Andre Sukumtot. His cardio started to slow down in round three and then he eventually injured himself, but was able to still see it out to the, to the decision and win that fight. But I just think that there's a lot of hype around Sean O'Malley right now. And I think the betting line reflects it because Vera is the much more well-rounded, the more proven fighter. He's fought and beaten the better competition. And I give Vera a cardio advantage here. I think he's a little bit better when he's moving backwards. I think he's the better clinch fighter. And I might even say he's the better grappler too. O'Malley's grappling hasn't been tested too much. He seems solid on the ground. But I think that Vera is a little bit better from top position. I think he's more dangerous with his submissions. But I will say that Vera is not very good off of his back, so we might see an unorthodox game plan from O'Malley here to hit offensive takedowns and look to exploit Vera's weaknesses off of his back. One of Vera's biggest problems is he starts slow. He tends to lose round one in most of his fights. So I do favor O'Malley in round one. I think he's going to be outstriking Vera and possibly even hurting Vera here. But if he doesn't get that round one finish, I think it's going to become a 50-50 fight. I would even start to favor Vera in those later rounds, round two and three. Very similar to the Song Yudong fight. Uh, Song Yudong was able to outstrike Vera in round one, but Vera had great cardio, great pressure in rounds two and three and was starting to outstrike uh, Yadong in that fight. He mixed up takedowns and distance striking and clinch striking. He just showed a very well-rounded and proven game Marlon Vera did in that fight. So I thought he deserved to win that fight versus Yadong. I had him clearly winning rounds two and three. That was a pretty bad decision. And I just really like what I saw from Marlon Vera in that fight. And I liked it enough to be picking him here as a plus 200 underdog. I think I'm picking all dogs on the main card so far. I like the value on Pineda. I like the value on Rosenstrike, Dodson. And I'm liking the value here on Vera. And I actually think that Vera withstands that early storm, makes it into rounds two and three, wins those later rounds. And he's probably going to win a decision here versus O'Malley. It's going to be a close decision. I think it, O'Malley is a legitimate fighter. I don't think he's going to get exposed as a fraud here, but I do think he's going to realize he's taken a massive step up in competition and he is going to lose by decision here. So I love the value on Vera at that plus 200 price. I will be betting him and I think he wins here via decision. The next fight is the main event of the evening for the UFC Heavyweight Championship. We have the trilogy between Stipe Miocic and Daniel Cormier. 
The opening betting line for this fight was a minus 110 pick em on both sides. Right now we are seeing Cormier minus 115 to Miocic minus 105. So there is going to be two way action coming in on this fight. It is the rubber match. DC won the first fight by round one knockout and Stipe won the second fight by round four knockout. I believe the second fight told us a lot more than the first one. The first fight was just a very high variance striking fight. Cormier was able to tie up Miocic in the clinch and land a nasty right hook on the exit from the clinch and knock out Stipe cold. But I think that the second fight proved that that was a bit of an anomaly because Stipe was getting outstruck in those early rounds. He was eating some big shots from Cormier, but he never looked extremely rocked. He was never close to being knocked out. And I think that DC just landed the perfect punch in that first fight that just shut Stipe's lights off. And I don't think that DC knocks Stipe out on the feet at a very high rate at all. I think the rematch proved to us that Stipe is the more technical and effective striker of the two because when DC was winning the striking, he was extremely aggressive and he was marching into the pocket and he didn't have good defense. He was kind of content to eat a few strikes to land three or four and that's just not a very reliable strategy. It's not a sustainable strategy and that's sort of why Cormier started to slow down later in that fight. He started to get outstruck. He started to get hit with a lot of body punches and eventually got finished in round four versus Mio. Now the wrestling is a big factor here. Cormier tried to wrestle in the second fight, was able to get Miocic down in round one, but he wasn't able to do much with that top position. He landed some ground and pound, but Miocic was just staying solid defensively, not trying to get up too recklessly, and just defending the ground and pound from Cormier. And that was a great strategy because Cormier didn't get the finish. And I think that the wrestling took more energy out of Cormier uh, than the benefit that he got from that. Because he was using so much energy to take Stipe down in round one. And after he got that takedown, he just got a little bit of top control time. Sure, he won round one. But by the time the third or fourth round hit, he was so tired that he got finished in that fourth round. I think that the body punch weakness that DC showed in that fight is just going to be such a clear path to victory for Stipe here. I just don't see how you don't favor Stipe Miocic in this third fight. He realized that DC cannot defend body punches. He cannot counter off body punches well. And at 41 years of age, I do not think DC is going to adapt the way he fights. He's not going to learn how to counter punch all of a sudden. It's pretty much engraved into the way he fights at this point. And I think that he will fight the same way he did. He's going to try to get Stipe out of there. He's going to come at Stipe aggressive, but he's going to get counter punched. He's going to get hit to the body a lot. And I think that he might make it competitive for the first two rounds. I think it probably gets into the third or fourth round but I think it's going to have a similar story to the rematch where Stipe is going to start to land cleaner DC is going to start to slow down and I think DC eventually gets finished in round three or four here so pretty similar outcome to the first fight it's going to be competitive I think DC might even win those early rounds but I think Stipe withstands that early storm from Cormier tires him out and starts to outstrike him later in the fight leading to a TKO I would be pretty surprised to see this fight go into the fifth round and go to the scorecards. I just don't think that DC's cardio can hold up that late into a fight at this stage of his career. And he's going to be taking so much damage in those early rounds. I don't see a way that either guy doesn't get finished in the first four rounds. So it was at minus 150 when I bet it. It is currently at minus 145. I will be betting Stipe small at plus money because I do favor him at closer to 60% here. But the biggest bet for me in this fight is going to be fight does not start round five. I think that's a great way to cover both sides because I think a finish is pretty likely from either side here. But the pick for me is going to be Stipe Miocic by TKO in round three to retain his heavyweight championship. So that is going to do it for this UFC 252 podcast. I like a lot of bets here. I think that Kai Kamaka and TJ Brown are good bets as favorites, and I like Stipe Miocic, Marlon Vera, Junior Dos Santos, John Dodson, Jim Miller, Ashley Yoder, and Daniel Pineda as underdogs here. I think there's a ton of value on those underdogs. Hopefully we can get back on track from that losing week we had last week and get back in the green here. So thank you all for listening to the podcast. Hope you all enjoyed the pay-per-view, and I will see you next week before the next UFC card. Peace. Peace.